Assalamu alaikum. Ah, oh, it is. Uh, it's so good to to be with you here tonight. It is so good to be with you tonight, uh, masks and all. Um, uh, thank you for so much for turning out tonight uh, and following our requests for uh, masking. Uh, we're we're uh, grateful for your patience. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were as safe as possible, so the lines for the food were a little longer than normal. Uh, but you've all been so patient, and we're really grateful for that. Um, and we're also grateful just for your support uh, all these many years. Many of you, many of you have been with us uh, in the Yenna Center for Middle East Peace from the very beginning, 16 years now. And uh, thank you for uh, your support. Uh, my name is Michael Spath, and I, uh, uh, I work with the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, and uh, we're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. We like to say that we're a, a community with a cause. It's the cause of dignity and uh, full civil, political, and human rights for all people, and indeed for the planet, uh, full rights for the planet itself. It's important as we gather tonight uh, to acknowledge that we do so on the traditional land of the Miami, Potawatomi, Shawnee, and Delaware tribes, and we pray that what we do here tonight will honor uh, them and those present among us today. Uh, we're so pleased to be welcome, welcoming Hueda Arif and Adam Shapiro and their children, D.R. and Mayar, uh, here tonight. Hueda, it's a, it's a, uh, at a girl. Uh, it, it's, a personal, it's a personal pleasure for me to welcome you and Adam and the kids here. It's a real treat. Thank you for coming. And, uh, uh, um, and she'll be receiving in just a few minutes our Champion of Justice Award. Uh, we also want to welcome uh, Fred Gilbert, one of the unheralded, really unheralded heroes uh, in our community, working with immigrant and refugee populations here for four decades. Uh, so, Fred, it's, welcome, uh, it's good to welcome you and Corrine uh, tonight and to honor you with our Joan Coslow Beacon of Peace Award. Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, like I say, is 16 years old now. Um, uh, this is our 12th gala. Uh, you can read some of our honored guests uh, in the program booklet. Uh, uh, we're really proud of the work we're doing. Tonight, we also need to acknowledge that our work together is more critically necessary than ever uh, in Palestine and Israel and uh, here at home, too, in northeast Indiana, in our state, and, of course, uh, in our nation. Even under these COVID restrictions these last 18 months, we've been very active and expanded our reach and our influence beyond northeast Indiana nationally and even internationally. Um, so the insert in your program lists some of the things that we've accomplished these last 18 months. And really, I'm not only proud of ourselves, but I'm proud of you all, our community of activists uh, um, for Palestine and for also other good work in this community and beyond. So thank you. And while it's important that we're glad to start slowly gathering back together uh, in person. It's also important to remember why we're here. We're happy to see each other. It's a celebration. But also, uh, we need to remember why we're here. For example, as you, as you know, tanks and bulldozers are still sitting on the streets of the East Jerusalem neighborhoods of Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan. And just last week, the Israeli Defense Ministry declared six Palestinian human rights organizations as terrorist organizations, including Al-Haq and Defense for Children International uh, Palestine, both of whom my groups have visited when we've gone on our solidarity tours, and we consider them as friends. I hope you read the statement that we released last week condemning Israel's actions, and uh, we'll do your part. We're part of... We were part of 288 organizations nationwide uh, to protest this action by the Israeli government. 
So tonight, while we're together, let's uh, redouble our efforts, pray for increased courage, and recommit ourselves to solidarity, arm in arm, hand in hand, with our Palestinian friends in their resistance to the Israeli ethnic cleansing project. You know, th this isn't activism 101. This isn't kindergarten activism. We're about graduate work in Palestinian solidarity. Hueda, you'll be addressing seasoned activists in this room. I mean, I, I look around the room tonight and uh, I see Peace Corps volunteers, teachers, nurses, therapists, social workers, fellow lawyers of yours working on issues of racial justice and refugee workers, LGBTQ, indigenous peoples, and Palestinian rights. So these folks here uh, stand with you, we stand with you in, in your important work. Our work isn't for the faint-hearted. Our mission is nothing less than a revolution, a revolution of values, a new creation to make the impossible possible and to midwife a more just and peaceable world which celebrates diversity and all life in all its forms, including the planet itself. So this is why we're here. You know, uh, my former pastor, John Gardner, used to talk about the church as a dream incubator. We want to be dream incubators in this room and bring these dreams uh, to life. So this is what drives us, and uh, this is why you have been so generous, so generous for all these many years for our work. And we will continue uh, to keep the faith. So thank you. Raise your hand. How, how many of you have been with me on our solidarity tours? Just raise your hand. Over, over 250 on 14 different tours. Thank you. If any of you are interested, we're going back in June, and so see me sometime tonight. I encourage you to take a look at our upcoming programs and mark them on your calendars. They're all free and open to the public because of your generosity. Uh, so now I'd, I'd like to invite our board chair, Terry Doherty, to come forward and say a word about the auction and then to present our Joan Coslow Beacon of Peace Award. Thanks, Mike. Well, it comes to me to um, introduce the Joan Coslow Beacon of Peace Award. The Beacon of Peace Award is named after Joan Coslow. Throughout her life, Joan was an ardent advocate for children's physical and mental health. Joan was a counselor and therapist instrumental in creating the local branch of the National Alliance for Mental Illness, NAMI. Longtime board member and benefactor of the Indiana Center of Middle East for Middle East Peace, and most of all, a dear and trusted friend. The 2021 Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, Joan Coslow Beacon of Peace Award honoree is Fred Gilbert. The award is given in recognition of an individual or organization that has demonstrated a strong commitment to peace with justice, promoting the dignity of the vulnerable and marginalized, and serving the community while maintaining a global perspective. The inscription on the award that I'm going to hand to Fred reads, um, after a four-and-a-half-year tour of duty in Turkey with the Air Force, working in public health, Fred Gilbert spent almost four decades as a social worker with special service to 29 refugee communities in northeast Indiana, including the Vietnamese, Laotian, and Burmese refugees, and I'll add to that the Afghan refugees, and Kosovars, and many others, and immigrants assisting them in gaining self-sufficiency and empowerment regionally, nationally, and internationally. Fred's advocacy includes liaison work 
among immigrant communities, social service agencies, and local, state, and national government authorities. Fred and his wife, Corrine, remain active in retirement with their two sons and families, including five grandchildren. They maintain their website, internationalfortwayne.org. Just string that together, internationalfortwayne.org, in advocacy work and policy advising, and look forward to welcoming the new wave of Afghans to Fort Wayne and Allen County. For his tireless efforts respecting the language and cultural traditions of immigrant communities, listening to their needs and as well as the resources they bring to their own empowerment, and exemplifying the values and gifts that Joan Coslow embodied in her life, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace expresses its profound gratitude and presents the 2021 Joan Coslow Beacon of Peace Award to Fred Gilbert. And so, Fred, if you would, come up to accept your award. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm honored to be associated with Joan Coslow's name, having known her as a social worker for a long time, plus the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, Michael, Terry, and many others that have been beacons of assimilation. To honor those who did serve in the last 20 years, it is our responsibility to welcome the new wave because they will become the seeds of the next generation in Afghanistan and they will be hell bound to return because this is what we do. We go back and make it better under the blessings of American freedom. Remember the words of Jimmy Carter when he said that we must stop killing each other's children. Thank you. And it's now my honor. Thank you, Terry. <clears throat> Fred, you're a blessing to all of us. Kareem, thank you for being here tonight. It's now my honor to present the uh, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace Champion of Justice Award to Huweda Araf. Huweda is a Palestinian-American lawyer, a courageous witness and tireless advocate for the Palestinian struggle for freedom, human dignity, and human rights. She's co-founder with husband Adam Shapiro and others of the Grassroots International Solidarity Movement, twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, focusing nonviolent direct, direct action methods and principles. She's been arrested multiple times by Israeli forces for her nonviolent demonstrations. Huweda has worked at the Arab American Institute and Seeds of Peace. She organized the first delegation of lawyers to enter Gaza after Israel's 2008-2009 Operation Cast Lead attack and wrote their follow-up report. She is former chair of the Free Gaza Movement. In 2008, she led five successful sea voyages to the Gaza Strip to confront and challenge Israel's illegal blockade and was one of the primary organizers of the Gaza Freedom Flotilla in 2010. In 2011, she was one of six Palestinian freedom riders inspired by the 1960s U.S. civil rights movement's freedom riders who attempted to ride segregated Israeli settler public transport. Co-chair of the National Lawyers Guild Palestine Subcommittee, she believes in the necessity of connect, quote, connecting struggles across identity and geographical boundaries, showing that our struggles are intertwined as is our collective liberation. She has also traveled to Lebanon with her husband to coordinate civilian relief efforts for refugees returning to the country. 
So for embodying the prophetic call for nonviolent resistance and the struggle for justice and liberation, Indiana Center for Middle East Peace expresses its profound gratitude and presents its 2021 Champion of Justice Award to Huweda Araf. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. I want to thank you, Fred. Congratulations on your award. Really what an honor it is to meet you, to be sitting at a table with you. More power to you for all the work that you've done and that you will continue doing. And I especially want to thank you for recognizing in your work the humanity, the culture, and respecting the dignity of all the refugees that you work with, which is, we see so many around the world fleeing from war, fleeing from the circumstances that are unlivable in their own countries, and we don't dignify their being by respecting them as, as people. Our politicians, how they talk about them, our governments, how they treat them. And it is people like Fred, like many of you, um, that help to change that, that help to these, these refugees, the people fleeing from unimaginable circumstances know that we are more than what our governments do. Our governments don't represent us. And so I, I wanna thank you again, Michael, everybody that is involved with the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace for welcoming me and my family here so warmly. It is really a pleasure to be here amongst you all because as, as Michael told me a number of times, you are activists, you are organizers, you are advocates. And in your work, I wanna thank you for supporting the Indiana Center and including Palestine in your work because we know all too well that there's just so much injustice out there. There is so much that we have to do that sometimes it gets really overwhelming. And it's so important to break through that, to overcome and to not let the magnitude of what we're up against immobilize us. And it's, I think it's gatherings like this that help us do that. It reminds us that we're not alone. We are many, we are powerful, if we believe that we are and we do our part. Let me tell you just a little bit about how I came to do this work. My parents are immigrants from Palestine. My father is from a village that was taken over by Israel in 1948. So it became part of Israel. Technically, we are Israeli citizens, but not treated equal by, by any means. And my mom is from a West Bank town of Beit Zahur, which is near Bethlehem, under full Israeli military occupation. And so when my parents were looking to start a new family. My mom was nine months pregnant with me. I'm the oldest of five children. They made their way to this country so that I and their future children could be born in a country that would give their children opportunity and equality, a chance to become whatever we wanted to become, something that is denied to Palestinians in the land of our ancestors. My dad found a job with General Motors was part of the union, the UAW, until he retired in 2012. My mother, a nurse, and they worked hard and were able to give us the life that they wanted us to have. We were by no means wealthy, but we weren't in want of anything. I remember how much my father worked, never turning down an opportunity to do overtime, double the double shifts, uh, never missing a day of work. I remember when I was in high school seeing him getting up at two o'clock in the morning so that he could be at the factory by four in the morning. I wouldn't see him again till the next night at 7 p.m. where he'd eat, shower, go to sleep so he can get up at two o'clock in the morning again. And never missing a day of work even when he had to get 16 stitches in his head because of a, 
an injury in the factory, got stitched up, and the next day went back to work. But, you know, they were able to put us all the five children through college. And it was in those years, recognizing the privilege that I had because of the decision that my parents made, that I started thinking about what is my responsibility to give back, especially knowing that millions of Palestinians don't have the opportunity that I have had. So in 2000, I accepted a position, a job working in Jerusalem, which is where I ended up meeting my husband, but it was a, it was a job working for a conflict resolution organization. This organization was supposed to bring together Palestinian and Israeli youth from the age of about 13 to 16. It was an age where they're old enough to, to understand the, the, the world and politics around them, but not too old so that they're completely jaded because the organization wanted them to learn to, um, to, to talk, to understand, to break down, to break through stereotypes, to break down the walls separating people. And I came to recognize in my time there that these programs are more destructive to Palestinian liberation than they are helpful. Because while the children came together and it was beautiful, and they had their first Israeli friend or their first Palestinian friend, and these friends became their best friends because they realized that they liked the same movies or they liked the same music, they danced to the same songs, the, the organization did not care and in fact avoided addressing the political situation that, tore the, that, that kept these children apart. And so when, we, when the children came together at our center in Jerusalem and we had to take them back home, the Israeli would go back home to his or her city or town, likely built on top of the ruins of Palestinian village or town. And the Palestinian, when, when we had to take them home, they had to walk under the guns of Israeli soldiers, likely the brother or the sister of their new best friend, and walk through checkpoint after checkpoint to get home to their surrounded and militarized uh, villages. And this program, Seeds of Peace, did not do anything to address that. In fact, when I started wanting to take children to see what a home demolition looks like in Jerusalem, I had to do that secretly because the administration would not approve of that. What these programs do is make people feel good, that they're supporting a program that promotes peace and brings people together. But unless we address the root cause of what is tearing people apart, then we're not changing anything. We're making ourselves feel good that we're, we're donating or we're supporting these people-to-people -people programs. And that's what our government is doing right now in this new spending bill allocated to $250 million to these people-to-people -people programs that do just that, while ignoring, really, the what, why Palestinians are in the situation that they're in, why there is no peace, because there is a settler colonial occupation that is, that is killing the indigenous people, that is pushing them out of their land. And so going back to where I was, a year of working with this organization and I ended up resigning. Shortly before I resigned, the Palestinian Intifada broke out. That was in September of 2000. It was triggered by, if any of you remember, then opposition uh, minister Ariel Sharon, who Palestinians believe have the blood of, of thousands of people on his hands. He went up in a very provocative move on to the Temple Mount, uh, Haram al-Sharif as we call it, in a show of basically disrespect to Palestinians and a show of complete control and authority like we can go whatever you, wherever we want, even to your most holiest sites, and, uh, and you can't do anything about it. And so Palestinians got angry, broke out in demonstrations. The Israeli forces fired at them live ammunition and killed seven people on the first day of protest, which only ignited more protests and then more Israeli forces shooting at them so that within the first month of the Intifada, which was largely unarmed Palestinian men, women, and children marching, I was in a lot of those marches, 127 people shot dead. I still am thankful that I have all my limbs. 127 people shot dead, mainly from bullet wounds to the chest and head area. 
So even if, you know, Israel is saying they were, these were riots or they were trying to keep the peace, not by shooting to the head and neck area. So Palestinian popular protests died down. You know, and it wasn't because Palestinians suddenly are unafraid to, to die or to sacrifice for their freedom. Because they've been doing it, we've been doing it for decades. But because we recognized, they recognized, the larger Israeli strategy of trying to get push Palestinians off their land. So a big part of Palestinian resistance today is sumud, is steadfastness. We have to stay on our land despite these policies intended to, to get us off. But what happened to the Intifada is it became armed. Those in Palestinian society, the, the, um, the political factions, started using their old weapons to shoot at Israeli military installations, at checkpoints, even at settlements, which didn't really make any strategic sense because we are no, we don't have an army, we are no match for one of the most powerful militaries in the world, but it was some way that they thought we are going to fight back. And that only gave Israel more of an excuse to come at us with their tanks and with their bulldozers and their armored personnel carriers and bombing our cities from the air so that the casualties piled up and I was, you know, a young, new graduate student, so idealistic and wanting to, wanting to take part, wanting to get in those streets, but there were no more po popular demonstrations and I couldn't pick up a gun, so what do I do? I started talking to leaders of Palestinian civil society saying, and thinking that I had these great ideas, like of, of creative marches that we can do, and they just looked at me and calmly taught me a little bit about the history of my own people and our resistance through the years and how Palestinians, although most people hear about us being terrorists, how most of our resistance in over 70 years has been largely nonviolent. How the height of, of probably Palestinian creative nonviolence in the first Intifada, this one was the second Intifada, and the first one was 1987 to about 1993 where Palestinians organized themselves. We didn't have the Palestinian Authority. Palestinians organized themselves in community groups and popular resistance groups that led a popular uprising. And intifada means shaking off, to, to shake off, shaking off the occupation and use creative means to take back control of their lives because the Israeli soldiers, Israeli military controlled even when businesses opened and closed in the occupied territory. So Palestinians, were taking that back by shutting down when they wanted to shut down, by doing strikes and boycotts and, and burning their ID cards and refusing to pay taxes in my mom's hometown of Beit Sahur, through which they were punished and, and they kept organizing kept organizing, distributing before the days of, civil, of uh, internet and social media. Uh, leaflets that tell everybody what we're doing on this day, when we're striking and for what, and everybody was involved. And most of the Palestinian people that I know today, especially the, young, uh, the men, spent a number of years of their lives in Israeli jail for being part of that organizing. But they did it proudly because it was our resistance. It was a collective resistance to, for our freedom. And when the Oslo Accords in 1993 were signed that was supposed to be a peace deal, okay, Palestinians were going to give it a chance. But in those seven years from 1993 to 2000 when I said the second intifada broke out, Israel used the cover of peace to continue colonizing the land, to expand settlements, which it's still doing today, to demolish Palestinian farmland, olive groves, demolish Palestinians' homes to push them out of Jerusalem to connect these settlements that they're building, connecting them with super highways that connect illegal settlement to settlement to go around Palestinian villages that they're surrounding with roads that are built on top of Palestinian farmland, roads that Palestinians cannot use because they're Palestinian. And so when the Intifada broke out, it wasn't just Ariel Sharon that went on the Temple Mount. It was Palestinians saying we no longer want to be part of this facade of a peace process. This is not a peace process. But the casualties were mounting and nobody was holding Israel accountable. And on top of that, Palestinians were being blamed for their own death because Palestinians, you walked away from the negotiating table. Yes, and Arafat is going back to his terrorist roots. That's what we heard. And the mainstream media wasn't covering it. It was Palestinians that started the violence. That's what you heard. 
And so when I was thinking what to do and hearing from Palestinian civil society leaders that, Hawaii, that's a good idea, but we've done that. We've done that for years and we're tired. And so in continuing to talk and to learn, the idea came to me and others to see if we can globalize this intifada. Let's have people really see what's going on here. And so the idea was, let's invite people from all over the world, all over the world to come here and stand with us. And I had these images of like thousands of people forming the civilian army and linking arms to prevent the Israeli bulldozers and tanks from rolling into Palestinian villages. And we organized for that. And when we had our first campaign, we didn't have thousands. We didn't even have hundreds. But we had 50 people that came mainly from the United States and, the, and Europe, bringing their experience listening to Palestinians and, and organizing and demonstrating with, with Palestinians, and then going back to their home country, telling people about what they saw, and sending more people to volunteer with us. We didn't really know what we were doing. You know, we put out some emails. Let's see if this will work. And 50 people came, and then those 50 people started the engine. They went back and told people and said, organize another campaign we're sending volunteers. So the next campaign we had, we had 100 people come. And those people went back and wrote op-eds and told their family and friends, and more people wanted to come. At the time, we were receiving volunteers, not funded by anyone, not registered by anyone, just a group of activists connecting with other people and connecting them to Palestinian villagers. And we were sending groups to Palestinian towns and villages, and we were able to send them to Gaza at the time, too which is now almost imaginable. But what was the point that we saw of the international solidarity movement? One, international volunteers could help Palestinian, well, let me not say help, walk side by side with Palestinians in the hopes that the Israeli military would not use lethal force against unarmed demonstrators because they might not care and they might not be able to, or, or be held accountable for Palestinian lives, but. They don't want to kill an international that they can't so easily label a terrorist. So we thought protective accompaniment, one. Two, we thought, you know, the media is calling us terrorists. We want to push the Jews into the sea. We can't accept Israel. All the things that you hear about Palestinians. Well, if people come from all over the world, and not just, you know, Americans and Europeans, but also people of all different backgrounds, all different religions, can come and say to the mainstream media, I'm standing here not because I'm, I want to push the... Israel into the sea or the Jews into the sea. Many of our volunteers were actually Jewish, Jewish Americans, coming to say it's because I am against occupation, I am against what Israel is doing here, and I'm standing on the side of freedom, hoping the mainstream media will cover that, helping to give Palestinians a voice. But if they weren't, the mainstream media wasn't going to cover it. The third thing internationals can do is actually travel more freely, go back to their home countries, and tell at least what they saw with their own eyes. People to people, we could create an alternative media that could bypass the mainstream media that censors itself. And the last thing that I saw as a strong pillar of the international solidarity movement was the hope that it gave to Palestinian civilians that feel that and really are up against one of the most powerful militaries in the world, backed by the only superpower in the world today, and feeling that nobody cares. I taught law in Jerusalem, and when my, my students would say, well, it was international law, like, they would tell me, well, this is all nice, miss, but it doesn't apply to us. Because, because international law, if any of you have studied international law, implementation is all political will. And, and the political will you know, is in the hands of the, the powerful. And we know what countries are the powerful and the, and the bullies right now. And so Palestinians really felt like nobody's paying attention. Nobody cares. And so when you and you and you travel, and not only to, to, to see and to talk to people, but actually to stand side by side with them. And our volunteers were arrested and deported and injured. But that gives people hope that we are not alone. Somebody cares. And there was a story I will never forget. In 2002, Israel had reinvaded all Palestinian villages. And they were conducting a military operation in Nablus, going door to door 
in the crowded refugee camp where to, to reduce the, their exposure, I guess, from kids that would throw rocks or whatnot. They were breaking into homes, ransacking these homes, and then blowing holes in the walls of these refugee homes that are so close together so that they can go from home to home without actually having to go outside. But we got word of, of this military operation going on in Nablus. And I was in Jerusalem training volunteers and sending them off. Not much we can do when, so, when a military operation like that is going on. Right? There isn't much we can do, but we could at least monitor. We can try to let so the Israeli soldiers know that we're watching you uh, in the hopes that, again, they'll be less violent in their actions. And we sent a team to Nablus. I was in Jerusalem and my phone rang. And it was a man from Nablus. He said that he is in his home with his wife and kids and the soldiers are going to come to his house soon. And he sees the internationals outside. He's like, I don't think that they can help me and my family. But I know that they're there. So thank you. And he hung up. And that hope is important, you know. To know that somebody cares if you are going to be able to see a, a, a tomorrow and to believe that there is something worth continuing for. We used to send people to Gaza also. But in 2003, in the spring of 2003, Israel stopped all internationals from going to Gaza because in the spring of 2003, they killed one of our volunteers, Rachel Corey, a 23-year-old college student from Olympia, Washington, who was run over by an Israeli bulldozer. Three weeks later, they injured another of our volunteers, but in Janine, firing shots uh, to his face. He survived. But a week after that, they killed another volunteer, one of our volunteers in Gaza. He was sniped in the head, Tom Herndahl, a 21-year-old uh, photography student from the UK. He was trying to move Palestinian children out of the line of Israeli fire. He bent down to pick up a child, and they shot him in the head. He lay in coma for nine months, and then he passed. And just a few weeks after that, the Israeli military shot and killed a British journalist. James Miller. So they were getting all in this short period of time some very bad press for injuring and killing uh, internationals. And so they stopped letting internationals go to Gaza. And we weren't able to access Gaza again until many years later. But in that time, in 2006, 2007, because Palestinians had an election and they, Israel didn't like who they elected, they s completely sealed off Gaza. I mean, it was already surrounded and it was already difficult to get in and out, but now it was tightly controlled who came in and out, what came in and out, and they reduced the number of, of aid trucks coming in, of permits that they gave for people to leave, people that needed to go to school, people that needed medical attention. They destroyed the economy because not only could people not leave and aid trucks coming in were, were lessened, but also being able to export so that you can have an economy, the things that you create. Gaza has some of the best strawberries I've ever tasted in my life, but when you can't export them, you know, and you can't import the raw materials in order to be able to build and to create uh, because Israel didn't let them do that. It was so ridiculous that the head of the United Nations at the time that I went in with a delegation told us, Israel turned back one of our trucks because we had shampoo and conditioner because shampoo was allowed but conditioner was not and so we had some two in one and they turned the truck back. But that is the kind of deliberate persecution of people that is designed to bring Palestinians to their knees. It's not about security, it's about control, it's about getting people to give up. And so reports were coming out, we were hearing the Save the Children and the UN were writing reports about Israel's closure policy was devastating the people of Gaza. There was, a, we were on the brink of a humanitarian crisis, rising rates of malnutrition, stunted growth. And I was just shocked, like stunted growth in Gaza. Gaza is not poor. Gaza is not poor. Gaza is being made poor because of this deliberate policy, and nobody is doing anything about it. So when we were thinking, what can we possibly do, because all of these reports aren't doing anything, one of our volunteers said, 
why don't we sail a boat to Gaza? And I said, whoa, well, we don't have a boat. And we don't have enough money to get a boat and we know absolutely nothing about boats, so what else can we do? But, you know, as, as we continued discussing, it, it, why not? Why not? Because we're not, Israel's not letting us go through, through Israel. Egypt was also closed off. We can't get in through there. Let's try this. Let's try to sail a boat from Cyprus to Gaza, international waters. We're not going to go into Israeli waters. And if Israel stops us, let us show the whole world that Israel's policy is not about security because here we're not a security threat. You know, and so we worked went into a lot of debts, but found two dilapidated fishing boats that we converted and made semi-seaworthy. And in the summer of 2008, 44 civilians from 17 different countries got ready to set sail. And I remember training people before we got on those boats. And one of the things I said is, you know what, we went through all these scenarios. Israel could um, injure all of you. They could try to sink our boats in the middle of the sea. Some of you, some of us might get killed. At best, maybe they'll just arrest us. And so if you're not ready for all of that, then don't get on those boats because we're not turning back. And not one volunteer turned, uh, stepped down. Even though I said, you know, it's not a problem. There are other groundwork that you can do. And in fact, a lot of people that stayed on the ground and people all over the world really supported our efforts by watching and, prevent it and providing those watchful eyes that monitored our ships. But we set sail not believing for one second that we were going to get into Gaza. But we just wanted to challenge the Navy, challenge this closure, and try to draw the world's attention to what was happening. But at the last minute, while we were out at sea and Israel had cut off all our communications and the media that we had arranged to come meet us never found us in the middle of the sea, one satellite phone that worked gave us word that the Israeli military is back down and they're not going to intercept your boats. And we realized that we were actually going to make it to Gaza. The first time any boats had done so in over 42 years without Israeli permission. And so as we got closer to Gaza, the, the, the port, and from afar I thought these were just like rocks and I don't know, seeing it from afar, but as we got closer I realized that all those things that I thought were colorful rocks were actually thousands and thousands of people. People that had rushed to the port when they heard that our boats were coming and they welcomed us with such open arms. In fact, young boys jumped into the sea. They, men got on their fishing boats and came out to us. And I remember thinking, these boys got to get out of the sea. This water is polluted. This water is polluted because Israel does not let Palestinians import the materials that they need to address their sewage system. And so 110 million liters of untreated or partially treated sewage is dumped into the Mediterranean Sea every single day but they came out to swim out to our boats. And when we got to sea, jumping up and down and hugging us, receiving us so warmly, even though we were mainly from Europe and the United States, the, the countries that give Israel cover and finances and protection at the United Nations to continue doing what it's doing. From the countries that is allowing Israel really to kill, to kill the two million people living in Gaza, to completely choke them off and they welcomed us with such love and such joy. Such joy that, and not because we were carrying humanitarian aids. Our boats barely carried us, you know. We weren't carrying aid. We had some balloons. We had some balloons on our boat and we had a little box of hearing aids. That's, that's all we could carry. But they were so happy that someone was challenging that policy, the policy that was doing this to them. And so they said, you know, we broke the siege. We, and, yeah, we chanted we broke the siege, but we knew we didn't really break the siege. To do that, we would have to keep going in and out over and over again until we opened a seaway. Uh, and maybe then you can say we broke the siege. And so we promised to do that. And when we left Gaza, we left some of our volunteers 
in Gaza, eight people, uh, to restart the international solidarity movement there. And in their place, we were able to take out um, some people that needed to leave, really, and were not allowed to. One of them was a 16-year-old boy, Sa'id, who had been injured in an Israeli military strike and had his leg amputated from the hip and was not allowed to leave to get any kind of medical attention to get a prosthetic leg. And so we put him in his wheelchair and his father on our, one of our fishing boats. And the other spaces went to a mother and her five children who was from Sweden, but she had family in Gaza and came to visit her family in Gaza two years before and then got trapped. Israel did not let her leave. So she was separated from her husband for over two years before we put her on our, our boats and were able to take them to Cyprus when then the boy was able to get, said, was able to get a prosthetic leg and, and this woman was reunited with her husband. But after that, you know, we ran a few more successful voyages but in the um, winter 2008-2009, Israel launched Operation Cast Lead on Gaza. Yeah, so now not only is Gaza completely encircled and two million people are living, are trapped in an area not much larger than Fort Wayne, really. Two million people trapped there for most of their lives, not able to leave. Uh, but then Israel come, comes and, and bombs them and destroyed thousands of homes and schools and churches and mosques and businesses and factories. We tried to sail an emergency boat and, and they hit our boat, nearly sank it. Um, actually, the, the, Lebanese, the Lebanese Navy or Coast Guard uh, saved us from sinking. And then a few weeks later, we tried to take another boat and they almost capsized that boat. So suddenly we realized, you know what? These small boats are not going to be able to get into Gaza anymore, so this tactic is not working. Either we give up or we escalate. And so we decided to escalate and plan a flotilla. And in the spring, in May of 2010, we had seven ships, many different countries participating. We had three cargo ships, four passenger boats, 10,000 tons of cargo of aid, of rebuilding supplies to help rebuild because Gaza, Israel had not let Gaza import the materials it needs to rebuild all of the damaged homes and schools and people were still homeless two years after, uh, after a massive bombardment. And 700 people, 700 people we set sail. And on May 31st, 2010, uh, we were attacked. We were attacked by the Israeli Navy. They launched an all-out assault on our ships and killed 10 of our, uh, 10 of our volunteers. We, um, one of those volunteers was a 19-year-old uh, student. He was Turkish-American. He was, had just finished school and was preparing to go to med school and was really excited to be on this humanitarian voyage to Gaza. A UN independent fact-finding commission investigated what happened. They found that this young man, Furqan, and four others of the 10 were most likely executed because they were shot but how the bullets entered their body at close range. Furkan, the last bullet to enter his body, was in his face. They also, this commission, found that after studying all the circumstances that Israel's blockade on Gaza is illegal. It violates international law because the harm to civilians completely outweighs any kind of military benefit that, that Israel could have. So it is illegal, and because it is illegal, Israel did not have a right to intercept our boats in international waters. We weren't in Israeli waters at all. And because they didn't have a right to intercept our boats in international waters, any use of force against us was illegal. And they killed 10 people. Five of them likely executed. One of them an American citizen, and the United States was the only country in the human rights Council at the UN to vote against adopting this human rights report, this investigation report. The only country. Never did anything about the fact that there's one of their citizens was most likely executed. And there has been no justice for 
the people that were injured and killed. Paddling on his sister. <laughs> so, you know, a after, after all of that, I, I said I would title my talk, why, why Be an Activist. All of the stuff that we did in Gaza is still completely sealed off. Not only is 110 million liters of untreated sewage being dumped into the Mediterranean Sea, but Israel controls where the farmer, where the uh, fishermen can fish, the fishers. You're supposed to have up to 20 nautical miles out where you can fish, but Israel limits uh, Gaza fishers to three to six nautical miles. So not only do you not have good fish, and about 35,000 people in Gaza rely, their families, on the, on the fishing industry, but they're also fishing in the most polluted of the water. And all of these businesses and factories destroyed, but when Palestinians then turn to their land, at least we can harvest their uh, agricultural land. Israel says it pulls out of Gaza, but it declares a lot of the land near where Israel has set up its border, no-go zones. And that's where one-third of the agricultural land is. So when Palestinians try to go to harvest their parsley or, or other vegetation that they can use to sell and feed their families, they get shot at by the Israeli army. So Gaza is still in this situation. The rest of Palestine isn't even any better. Why continue this activism? Why be an activist? Because of Ali, 75-year-old man from Gaza, who held up his key, likely passed down to him from his parents, and said, for 70 years, and nobody is listening to us, before he set out to march with the Gaza Freedom March. The Gaza Freedom March, thousands of people of Gaza, most of them refugees, marching unarmed to where Israel has set up this artificial border, saying that enough, enough of the blockade we want to go back home. Most of those refugees, if they stand on a high building top, whatever's left in Gaza, they can see their homes beyond the Gaza borders, but haven't been able to go there. Wanting to go home, a freedom march. And you know what Israel did? Put its snipers on the hilltop surrounding Gaza and shot at the people marching like fish in a barrel. So on the first day of those marches, 17 people were shot dead, 1,500 were injured. And despite that, every Friday for two years, People gathered and marched. 224 people were killed. 36,000 injuries. 156 of those injuries resulted in multiple amputations. And yet those people, the amputees, you know what a lot of them did? They formed an amputee soccer team so that they are still playing. Why be an activist? Because in Israel right now, 4,500 Palestinian political prisoners, 200 of them are children. You know how these children are arrested? They're dragged from their beds in the middle of the night. They're woken up at gunpoint. They're blindfolded, put in a military jeep. Their parents aren't allowed to come with them. They are interrogated, kept from eating, kept from using the restroom, told they can't have a lawyer. And then they're thrown in military prison, they are put before a court, a court that has a conviction rate of 99.5%. So these children you lose years of their lives, maybe for throwing a stone, maybe for knowing someone to throw a stone, or maybe for, maybe for nothing. One of those, um, well, from those 4,500 that are political prisoners right now, including children, right now, today, 520 of them, no charge at all. No charge, no trial. They don't know why they're being held in Israel. And its law can hold Palestinians without charge for three to six months, renewable. So it could be the last day, six months, they haven't charged you, they're gonna release you. Nope, it was just renewed for another six months, for years. 520 are now being held. They call it administrative detention. It is really, a, it is really 
detention uh, without charge, no due process at all. And so six of those that are without charge have been locked up for months and over a year, especially Kayed, uh, Kayed Fosfos. He has been on hunger strike for 107 days. He is probably getting close to his last breath uh, in an Israeli hospital. Ala al Araj, 83 days. Miqdad Qawasmi, 100 days without food because they are held without charge, separated from their families, and they have nothing to fight with but their bodies. Because there's a village inside Israel, you know, I say where I'm an Israeli citizen, my dad's an Israeli citizen, there are villages inside Israel where there are Israeli citizens, but they're Palestinian, and Israel doesn't want them there. One of those is named Al Araqib. It's in the southern part of Israel, in Naqab, or uh, the Negev, they call it. That village has been demolished 186 times. They don't have homes, they have corrugated tin and tents. And the bulldozers come in and tear it up. And the people get right back and, and rebuild it. 186 times. And the people get right back up and rebuild it. Because in Jerusalem, Palestinian families are being taken out of their homes so Jewish families can move in. And so you have situations where Palestinians are in a tent across the street from what, would, what was their home for decades that now a Jewish family moved in. And they don't have much recourse in Israeli courts because the courts are not for them, just like my students said, the law is not for us. Because in the South Hebron Hills, if any of you have been to that area, thousands of Palestinians live in, without being able to be connected to the water system, without being able to rebuild so that they're living in caves or corrugated tin shacks and Israel wants to get rid of them. So they, these, are, um, these are farmers, they live off the land, they live off their animals. And they can't even connect to the water grid so that they can feed their, um, or, or, or give water to their animals so they can water their crops. And so what do they do? They have to buy back water from Israel at four times the price that Israelis pay, water that is confiscated from them because it is on their land, but they can't drill wells. If they make a well to get to the water, Israel comes and demolishes it. And also their caves or their tin shacks, Israel demolishes. Almost on a weekly basis, they come in with their forces and their bulldozers and flatten. And there is one woman, Farisa, Farisa Abu, uh, Abu Aram. She's from one of these uh, small communities in the South Hebron Hills. And when the bulldozer came to demolish her home, one, an activist that was there, an Israeli activist, said he could hear the, the civilian administration tell the soldiers and the bulldozers to not let her take anything out of her home so that she is not able to rebuild. And so when they flattened her home, it was on top of the very little that she had, the pots and pans, her children's school bags. And one month later, when her son was trying to rebuild, he was using a generator. You know? And so Israeli forces came in and tried to confiscate that generator from him, and he hung on to it. He hung on to it, and so they shot him in the neck. And, um, and he's now completely paralyzed, can only move his eyes, and forget about having a wheelchair in these communities or being able to get rehabilitated. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot more stories to tell. I'll say one more, one more, because there are so many, and they're the ones that keep us going. Because hopefully one day there won't be another situation like the one where this little girl in Gaza had to endure. Aisha Lulu. She was a five-year-old girl who had the misfortune of being born in Gaza, but by all reports, she was a really bubbly child until one day she just, something was wrong. And after her parents taking her to different doctors in Gaza, they uh, discovered that she had a brain tumor. 
they couldn't treat her in Gaza. They just, I mean, Israel doesn't let in the medical supplies that they need. Uh, but there was a, a Palestinian hospital in Jerusalem that could treat her and that they said that they would. And so the little girl got permission from Israel to go to this hospital in Maqasid in Jerusalem, but you know what? Her parents didn't get permission to go with her. Uh, and they applied and reapplied, not her mother, not her father, not her aunt, not her uncle, not her neighbor. Everyone that applied around her was denied permission to go with her until the Israeli military granted permission to somebody, but Aisha didn't know them, but it was somebody in Gaza, that, uh, an elderly woman that would be able to accompany her. And so in tears, Aisha got in taxi with this woman that she barely knew to go have brain surgery in Gaza. In, uh, in Jerusalem. And that surgery, though, went well. But she was in such distress because she couldn't be with her family. The doctor, the surgeon, told her parents, do whatever you can to get here because it is affecting her and her recovery that she is so upset. They couldn't get to her. They couldn't get to her. And she stopped talking. And when she closed her eyes for the last time, she was all alone. That's the, the degree to which Israel controls every aspect of the lives of Palestinians. And so we're activists because people like Ali and Fariza and Kayed, they don't have a choice. They don't have the luxury of asking themselves that question. You know, and, and because we care, right? We care not to leave people to the forces that would inflict this kind of pain and suffering because we care to create a better world. We know that there are tragedies all over the world. In, in the Middle East, there are still boatloads of refugees, Syrian refugees trying to make their way to Europe boats that are still sinking in the Mediterranean because European countries won't give refugees the, the dignity of letting them become refugees so that they have to risk their lives in the middle of the sea. In this country, all over the country, our very right to vote right, is being attacked. In Texas, women are living in fear. They don't have the right anymore to control their own bodies because the legislature just enacted this vigilante justice. We have so many people sitting in jail right now, wrongly accused, wrongly convicted, or convicted for very minor crimes and spending their years, years of their lives in jail. One of them, you know, Henry Hentz. My kids know Henry's name because he sent them uh, dolls that they've made in prison. He's been in jail for 42 years. His co-defendant was let off he got his conviction overturned. He was white and wealthy, and, and Henry is black and poor. He's been in jail for 42 years, and as a lawyer who reviewed his, the evidence in his case, he, he didn't do it. He didn't do it, but he has exhausted all of his appeals. No judge will look at anything he writes anymore. But he keeps in touch with me. He always asks about my kid, and a few months ago, he sent me a letter that said, I've asked my brother to send you a check use it to help the Palestinians. Know that this is but a blade of grass in the bushels that I wish I could give you. And I can't be with you, with you and your friends and your family marching for the great injustices that they are enduring, but know, my friend, that I am with you 1,000%. People like that shouldn't be in jail in this country. It shouldn't be that here in Indiana, at minimum wage, you have to work 74 hours a week to be able to afford a one-bedroom apartment. 91 hours a week if you want to afford a two-bedroom apartment. It shouldn't be in this country that we have 11,000 children that live in poverty in, one of the, in the richest country in the world where children can't find enough to eat. That's why were activists, and, and that's why I, I bring my kids to, to these things. When I was invited, I asked Michael if I could bring my kids 
because I want them to also know, like I came to realize the privilege that I've had and to know also that they have a responsibility, not to burden them at this young age, but, but they also have, have this innocence that I want them to, to combine with the knowledge that they're getting and to be able to hold on to that and to translate it into the work that it's going to take to make this a better place. You know, my daughters, a lot of her and my son's clothes say, we can change the world. And we put that on a lot of kids' clothes, if you see. We can change the world. But what happens to a lot of us when we get older? <laughs> oh, and there, she's showing it off for you right now. <laughs> you know, um, speaking of, of hunger and children, I want to quote uh, a young 10-year-old girl it in this video. Some of you might have seen it on the internet. It was back really in 1990 and she was speaking at a press conference on world hunger in her school and she said, I'm here because I care. And she talked about the children just like her dying of hunger around the world and about her dream of eliminating world hunger saying, my dream can and will come true if we all look into the future and see the light that shines there. If we ignore hunger, that light will go out. But if we all help and work together, it will grow and burn free with the potential of tomorrow. 13 years later, that girl traveled to Palestine and she volunteered with us in the International Solidarity Movement. And she wrote home to her mom from Palestine in one of the emails she wrote, I'm rambling. Just want to write to my mom and tell her that I'm witnessing this chronic, insidious genocide. And I'm really scared and questioning my fundamental belief in the goodness of human nature. This has to stop. I think it's a good idea for us to drop everything and devote our lives to making this stop. I'm disappointed that this is the base reality of our world and that we, in fact, participate in it. This is not at all what I asked for when I came into this world. This is not what all the people here asked for when they came into this world. This is not the world you and dad wanted me to come into when you decided to have me. This is not what I meant when I looked at Capitol Lake and said, this is the wide world and I'm coming to it. I did not mean that I was coming into a world where I could live a comfortable life and possibly with no effort at all, exist in complete unawareness of my participation in genocide. Two weeks later, that, um, that girl, Rachel, stood in front of that military bulldozer that ran her over and crushed her to death. Minutes before, she was shouting at the soldier, sitting in the cab of that bulldozer, saying, what would your mother think of what you were doing? I don't know what he thought when he ran her over. That was 18 years ago that Rachel was killed, but her words live on. And one of the things that she wrote home to her mother that I think is especially poignant for us, she wrote, just hearing about what you're doing makes me feel less alone, less useless, less invisible. The international media and our government aren't going to tell us that we are effective, important, justified in our work, courageous, intelligent, valuable. We have to do that for each other. And one way we can do that is by continuing our work visibly. Indeed, she said, we can choose to stand in solidarity with those working for their lives, or we can do nothing. And I know that, again, every single one of you is here because we care about creating a better world. But sometimes we can get down. I mean, I get down, we get overwhelmed. We can doubt our effectiveness. But let us just have more of these gatherings and uplift each other and remind ourselves that we are powerful and keep on with the optimism and childlike belief in an ability to do anything. Um, my daughter actually, helps me with that, you know, one, a few years ago, she probably won't remember this, but uh, she was about three, and we were in a car, and I put on a, pal a Palestinian song, 
about resistance and about fighting injustice. And she asked me what it meant. And so it was in Arabic. And so I translated to her and told her it was because Israel took our land and we want to fight for our land. And when she learned that Israel took our land, she's like, well, we have to get it back, mama. And I said, well, yes, we do. And she said, well, we have to put on our superhero costumes and fight them. And she said, I'll be Batgirl, and you're Wonder Woman, and Baba's Batman, and Diyara's Superman, and we can fight. You know? Do you remember? No, you don't remember. I, I remember. I remember. And you know, I, I, see a lot of, I see a lot of capes in this room. And our capes might not make us, you know, superhuman. It doesn't make us fly, but, but working together, I think with the knowledge that it takes us, it takes us to make change and believing that we are effective. You know, we are a damn strong force and I am really, really honored again to be standing here with every single one of you and going forth to continue our work, really creating the better world that we know can come about, that we envision and that we and they deserve. So thank you again for all of you do.